Um, well, as you guessed, this is the terrible, rotting old hulk that we had to go to Nosy Mangabe in. And it, was, it, it didn't fulfill what, to my mind, was the sort of basic criteria of a boat, in that it, it, in, in that it was basically full of ocean. And it seemed to me that <laughs> the whole point of a boat was to keep the ocean on the outside. Um, anyway, so we crossed to Nosy Mangabe. And it's this tiny little, very, very beautiful little rainforest island. And uh, we hit a major problem, which of course is that um, um, this animal not only lives in trees, nobody has seen it for years and years and years, not only li it lives in trees, but it's also it's a nocturnal animal. Um, and the quality of batteries in Madagascar is very, very poor. Uh, so we spent night after night after night traipsing through the rainforest in what can only be described as the rain. getting rather ratty and basically we just spent night after night sort of huddled under tarpaulins and looking at it stopped raining yet um, and every now and then we sort of go out and try and find this damn animal and we actually there's this wonderful we found this hut it used to be the sort of game wardens not game warden it was um, a, a, a ranger's hut and it was a tiny little hut and it was actually full of wildlife um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> What happened, you see, is, is you'd, um, um, you'd open the door and you would hear all this noise. And you'd turn on the light and it would all stop. <laughs> and you'd see these sort of giant spiders around the wall, each with a sort of half-eaten bug in their mouth. Say yes. <laughs> and you turn the light out. <laughs> so this is our shelter. You know, we were having a great time. Uh, and eventually, but eventually, but one night, one night, we were all sort of, as I say, huddled under our tarpaulins, and I sort of got out and had a wander around. And suddenly, suddenly, I looked up. And on a branch about that high above my head, this creature came out. This creature came out along the branch, looked down at me, and I looked at it. And as it looked at me, it obviously didn't at all like the look of what it saw. It turned around and went away again. <laughs> the whole encounter about 10 seconds. And that's what we'd come for. That I, I had actually seen, and we saw, and we all just managed to get a quick photograph of it when it appeared. But I'd suddenly realized we'd seen an eye eye. Now, I was absolutely transfixed by that moment for reasons that I couldn't entirely explain to myself immediately. Um, because a month earlier, I'd never even heard of this animal. And now here, here I was, staring at it, thinking there's something extraordinary happening here. So I began to sort of think about it a little bit. And the thought I put together was this, that in traveling here, in traveling on, uh, on the 747 to Tananarive, which is the capital of Madagascar, in this terrible old jalopy of an airplane that took us up to the um, northwest corner, and then in the decreasingly excellent series of carts and trucks, and uh, then in the rotting old hulk that took us to uh, the rainforest, where we basically walked through the rainforest night after night. It was as if we were taking a kind of time journey, a time travel journey, back through the history of twig technology. <laughs> and what this encounter had been, what this encounter had been, was I was a monkey looking at a lemur. And you suddenly think, there is a huge amount of history to this moment that we don't think, we don't realize we carry around with us. Our, our, our roots in this planet go back an awfully, awfully, awfully long way. And we don't tend to think about that very much. And it takes a confrontation like this suddenly to, be a, to, 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 to realize how sort of broad and deep your family goes. So I thought, well, this is terribly interesting. And I talked to the guy who'd been 
kind of my guide out there, who is a, a zoologist who'd been sent along to make, make sure I didn't sort of fall out of trees and so on. Um, and his name was Mark Carwardine. And I said, um, I would love it if we could, come, do you fancy the idea of sort of going around the world and looking for other rare and endangered species of animal, maybe de doing a book about it? He said, well, that's what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> so yeah, okay. Um, and so we did. Now, I, there was a pause at that moment because I had a couple of novels I'd just contracted to write. Um, so I wrote Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency and The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, and then it was time to go. And the first place we went, we went to look for a particular animal, which was the Komodo dragon lizard. Now, you know what lizards are like, don't you? I mean, they're sort of... <laughs> nice little sort of green. This, uh, the Komodo dragon lizard is a little bit bigger than that. Um, uh, the biggest one we saw actually was um, about 13 feet long. And its head came up to about here. Um, uh, fucking huge, I think, is the technical <laughs> term. Um, it's thought they're the origin of the Chinese dragon myth because they are huge, well, huge giant, giant lizards. They're scaly, um, they're man-eaters, literally they are man-eaters, and they don't actually breathe fire, but they do have the worst breath of any creature known to man. Um, and, um, and they live on this island called Komodo. Now, it, it's not enough, it turns out, that this island has 1,500, 1,500 man-eating dragons on it. Um, it, it. It turns out that actually the most endangered animal on the, on the island is anything other than the dragons. <laughs> and in fact, they, they, when I say they're man-eaters, they, 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 they don't actually eat you sort of straight out. They don't sort of lunge at you and just gobble you all up. They sort of sneak around and they come and give you a bit of a bite um, because the, the, the saliva is so virulent that, uh, that your wound will not heal and after a while you will die. And, it doesn't, and so one of the dragons will get to eat you. It doesn't matter if it's the same one that ate you. They just, uh, they just have a strategy of having as many dead and dying creatures lying around the island <laughs> as they can manage and that kind of keeps them going. Um, but it, it turns out it's not enough that the island has 1,500 man-eating dragons on it. Just to make it a little bit more interesting, it also has more poisonous snakes on it per square meter of land than any equivalent area of land anywhere on Earth. So we approached Komodo, I have to say, slightly nervously and in a slightly roundabout way. Uh, in fact, we approached it in such a roundabout way that we went via Melbourne in Australia. Um, <laughs> And uh, the reason we went via Melbourne was that somebody who wanted to go and see them, uh, a man called Dr. Struan Sutherland. Um, and um, I actually want to read you a little bit of, um, uh, about him. He was um, uh, a, a great expert in, in, in snake venom. And um, I should apologize before I read this, actually, for the fact that I don't do a... My Australian accent isn't very good, but then, what the hell, you're all Americans, you won't know the difference anyway. Um, <laughs> There is in Melbourne a man who probably knows more about poisonous snakes than anyone else on earth. 